to be honest, I quite enjoyed uh, uh, the poverty uh, cure clip that was shown today. And uh, full disclosure, I have been very much inspired uh, by poverty cure. And in fact, before poverty, before I saw uh, Poverty Inc., which of course is uh, collects most of the poverty cure series together, I was uh, working just on pro-life issues and. Uh, and aid was always at the back of my mind, and I was quite disturbed by what I saw from the pro-life perspective with regards to aid. But it was when I watched Poverty Inc. and I spoke with Michael Matheson uh, Miller, who was the guy who was in this video. So it's quite a small world, eh? And then it was him who then kind of talked me through how uh, they went on their own investigations, and in a way, that then allowed me to do a similar investigation, but on another side of aid. So you will uh, see a bit of my work uh, today. So it, it quite fits into what you've just seen. This is quite uh, since my work is going to be so easy because <laughs> you you've learned half of half of all of much of it. So the charity that hurts. Um, now a lot of people know what aid is, right? Humanitarian aid is something that people talk about and, and people, uh, if, if you would ask anyone what is it, you, you can tell, you've just watched this, uh, the, uh, this part of the series just now. Um, but uh, when I started doing much study and research on it and writing on it, I realized we don't, most people don't actually know uh, the, you know, the, the root of aid and, and the, the to, let's say, the technical part of aid. So, I will give you a little bit of it, so that in addition to everything you've just seen in, in, the, in, in the series, you can speak with a bit more authority, because aid is something that only the people at the UN sit on, the, on those, or, you know, on the facts and the stats, so that people cannot speak with authority on it. So I'll just give you a little bit of a glance. Uh, when it comes to aid, there are three big questions that people ask. How much really, how much aid is being thrown around? How much aid in, in total? And who receives aid? And who is given it? These are some of the basic questions. So, right. How much aid is there? Of course, that's a little bit of a, you've, you've just uh, picked up a bit if you remember what was in the series, but that's the total. But each year, it does work out at about 146 billion. That's where we are right now. It wasn't always the case. Uh, but about 146 billion as of 2017. And much of the information about aid you can find through one particular organization that exists just to track aid, and that's the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, OECD. So you can go through their website. This is what the graph looks like since uh, before the 1970s. And what, this is not just for Africa, this is for the developing world. So you can see that it's only gone up. It has only gone up, never down, just going up, going up, eh? from, from where it was from uh, the uh, 1960s, I'd say, just after the independence of most of the, of the uh, developing countries that were colonized. So that's how much. Who then receives it? About 150 countries receive, would receive aid. Uh, and how it's judged is by per capita income, if a country's per capita income, is less than 12,200 USD as of 2015, you will make it on the list, but then that, then they will then decide how much uh, each country gets. And this is kind of what it looks like. Yeah? It's a bit, just a bit of a technical thing. When I talk to people, it's always, you know, and people say, oh, you know, all you conspiracy theories, but we say the global south, right? But when you look at this map, it really is the global south. We are the ones who get the aid. We are the ones who are in this, you know, uh, subordinated position, we are the ones who are forever looking up. Uh, so it's these, these are some of the places. Eh? And who is given it? Uh, about 35 entities, eh? more 34 nations, plus the EU standing in as a member as well. And they, they form this uh, thing called the DAC, so the DAC countries, eh? Development Assistance Committee countries. And that's what it looks like, but that list had not been updated. There are about four countries that actually are in there, and Israel is in there, and now Israel does give a lot of aid. Most of them are European countries, plus Canada, plus United States, but uh, as a rule of thumb there, mostly uh, European countries, uh, plus Japan and South Korea. So that's not really the main thing I want to talk about. Now, the donors 
I classify them into three main groups, but it is not all inclusive, but three main groups that capture most, most of them. Eh? So they are the nations, they are the organizations, and they are the private foundations. There are, of course, some others that don't quite fall in. In fact, I'd say, plus the institutions like the EU, as well as you can see, they're part of the DAC countries, uh, or they're part of the DAC members. But uh, they, they, they're, not, they're not nation per se, they're not organization per se, you know, uh, they're not foundations either. The foundations would be like the Gates Foundation and the Clinton Foundation, those kinds of things. So, so my own personal interest, I've just given you a bit of a background. The reason why I had to go through these first three slides is because what I am about to talk about I don't want to have to be explaining it, so at least you know. So my main interest when it comes to foreign aid is the, the part of it called the social sector foreign aid. So in aid there is of course the debt, uh, the debt relief which is also part of aid. Uh, there is the aid that is given for, uh, for the economic, uh, economic structures, for production, which would have things like agriculture under it, but the main one which is my interest, but which also is the one most people know as aid, is social sector foreign aid. And I'll, you'd see why I say it's the one most people know about. It is when you talk about education falls under it, healthcare falls under it, water supply and sanitation, government and civil society, and this category right here, which is my one, <laughs> population and reproductive health and others, which would be all the other little things. <coughs> when, when anyone is thinking of aid, as even in public care, when they were talking about aid, a lot of it would fall under, under that. If not, then it would fall under the economic part of things or the production. So, so these, these are uh, the things that we get money for as aid, recipient, uh, uh, aid receiving countries under social sector foreign aid. And uh, I mean, each country will get money for education, money for this, money for that, and you will get money according to what the donor thinks you need. Eh? So it's it's how they they rate it each year. They give them, you know, it's like, it's like a parent giving a child money for pocket money, and they decide how much you get for the for the sweets and for the for the food and for the whatever. So on net demands of the people, though. The unmet demands of the people because when they give us this they talk about our unmet needs it's something the unmet need has been something i find quite problematic because we hear it everywhere we go to the united nations we hear people talking about the unmet need of african women the unmet need and they keep putting money here and just keep saying but there's the unmet need for that but i have gone through different african countries and what i like to say to people is that Africans actually have their met demand, not, their, not what you think is their met need, it's their met demand. And when you come into a country, what the easiest way, the easiest way that one can actually uh, find out what is it that is important to the Canadian people, or to the American people, or to the Nigerian people, or to the Nicaraguans, the fastest way and the most reliable way, I would say, is to, to listen very closely when, when the politics is on. Because whenever there is any it's political season, then the politicians begin to promise the people what they think the people want or what the people want, always demand. So uh, anytime we hear a, a politician promising reproductive rights and all those things, you know an election is about to happen and it's in, the, in a Western country. So last election season in my country, we just had elections a few weeks ago, only a few weeks ago, back in I think like three or four weeks ago. And during the election season, when things were hot, I was following very closely uh, the Twitter account, because I live on Twitter and it's a bad thing, don't do that. <laughs> don't be like me. So, <laughs> but I was following the Twitter account of uh, the, the main contender against the, the sitting president. So uh, Atiku, this was one of the, his campaign accounts. And look at the list of things that they're promising the night that he was promising or his campaign was promising the Nigerian people. It does kind of match a little bit some of the things in the social sector for it, if you if you look at it. But the one thing that you notice that isn't there is reproductive health. 
because nobody goes around in African countries promising people reproductive health or population anything, because people will then not vote you. <laughs> they will know not to vote you, but education, you know, employment, security, the economy, infrastructure, job, these are the things that Africans are asking for themselves. And even if you're not too sure, you just open your ears and eyes during their elections, because every country has elections, and they're campaigning in the same strategies. Uh, as, as you do here, the politicians will be tweeting and talking about these things. If you follow them and listen to what they're saying, they're promising the people what the people are asking for. So that's a very easy way. So these are all the things that, that he, he's promising and he was eventually didn't win the election. But, but, but yeah, that, those are the things. Now, we, I'm so sorry, this, the screen is a little bit small, but with limited resources, what is going to population programs? So just bearing in mind what you've just seen now about <coughs> what we are talking about during our own election seasons in different African countries, and my country particularly, which is of course a, a, a big African country that you can see, you can get a very good feel of what it is like in other places. Uh, this is what the foreign aid, so, uh, social sector foreign aid is for Africa and have been since 1996. This, the day I, the first day I saw this graph, I wept because I got this graph from their own, uh, their own data, their own archives. This is how Africans have been given money by the donors since 96, at least this particular graph tracked the data from 1996. And education, at one point uh, was high up uh, in, in the things that they were getting, very much uh, uh, government and civil society, so that would fall under things like referendum and, and all of those things. Then water and sanitation, healthcare, but you can see that population program was once upon a time, not all that long ago, the very lowest thing because no one was really asking for it. You know, no, no developing country is going around saying, give us money for condoms or contraception or abortion for that matter. And, and the donors perhaps at the time still cared about what the, the recipients were asking for, what they felt the recipients were asking for. And nobody was really putting money there. And all of a sudden, it just started going up and up and up. And now, at least as of 2013, 2014, Population programs was now getting the most amount of money funding put into it. Whereas everything else, you can see education is going all the way down. Everything is going all the way down, but population programs stayed up. Now, when there was a, huge, uh, a very uh, steep nosedive, was about like, uh, 2009, everybody started reducing everything. And that was, if you wonder what happened, that was during the recession. Uh, 2009, 2010, but no one touched the condoms that they were bringing to us because we had to have those, even in a recession. <laughs> now, if you think, okay, maybe the Africans are getting all of this, who knows? Maybe everybody is getting the same thing. Maybe it's the phenomenon that, is, that the donors, the new strategy the donors have started to use. That's what it looks like for Asia. You can see how much the Asians again, you know, what happens with their population program allocated to them? So it's right on the bottom. That's what Latin America gets. Same graph. But everything else is on, is on top. The population just kind of has stayed, stayed pretty much the same, close to zero. And that's what, uh, oh, what was that? Avala, this is Oceania. So the, F the Fiji Islands and all those little countries out there that are uh, developing countries, that's, that's again the same, quite similar. The Americas, oh, and that's, that's Africa. So you can see what they're doing to the Africans. But the Africans, more than anybody else, are actually rejecting. They are very, they're very particular about not wanting this, and yet this is what what comes to us, or how it's been allocated uh, from, you know, from the from the mid nineties. 
Oh well. So, the actual expenditure in 1993 for everyone, for all the developing countries, the, uh, the donors were giving about 610 million as of 1993 was 610 million given to population programs and reproductive health expenditure. That was what was being spent. By 2012, only 19 years, 12.4 billion dollars. If you wonder how much increase has happened, if you can wrap your head around this kind of percentage increase. I couldn't. I did the math several times. It's correct though. 1,932% 1 increase on the money, the condom money, basically. So, a total of more than $100 billion given over in over 20 years. And Africa gets about 70% of all that, by the way. And that's why our graph just looks incredibly uh, crazy, just going off. So 70% goes to Africa. This is again another, another look at that graph, the same graph, but this is what each, each Western country is giving because that's what all the donors together are giving. So all the DAC, uh, members are given, but this is each of the DAC members and what they give. And if you wonder, everywhere you see red is, um, yeah, it's population, population, health for population. So I, I took the liberty to do that just for you, so that you can see what your country is doing now. Well, this was in 2014, so everyone knows that 2014 was, of course, another administration. So this is kind of what it looked like, and that's what Britain looked like, and that's what the United States looked like. So. The Canadians in 2014 were giving 17.6% to education to Africa, so particular, particularly to Africa. They were giving 18.2% to health. They were giving 3.3% 3 to population and reproductive health. So I then did a comparison of all of them just so that you can see. Yeah? The UK was given 4.3% to education. They were giving five, only 5% 5 to health. Uh, 43.8% to population and reproductive health. The United States was very similar, 4% to education, 8.4% to health, 31.4% to population. And mind you, this is of everything that is given to Africa. This is so a good third, and this, this for, the, for the United Kingdom, in that particular year, it was almost half of everything they gave us was for reproductive health. And the Canadians, of course, you just saw all the statistics. It's the same thing, yeah? So you can see how you compared in 2014. So 2014 is a significant year because I think by 2015, things changed. And by 2017, the Canadian government then had a whole new approach to what they did with us and how they dealt with how they started dealing with Africa. So I call this food laced with ideology. And you would see why. It's because I had this, um, I found this document from your government archives, which was from the Canadian government's funding plan entitled Canada's Leadership on Sexual Aid, uh, on Sexual and Reproductive Health and Rights. So you can also go find this document. I think it should still be on the government website. Um, Canada donated to Ethiopia through UNICEF. Um, so it's one country. This is only an example. This. So I'm going to... I think I wrote it out. So this, I just put it here. If you read this, this was a project, mind you, UNICEF, so it was something that had to do with education. They were targeting Ethiopian adolescent girls, so minors particularly. But in here, your government says they're giving 15 million over the period from 2017 to 2022. They were to provide youth-friendly sexual and reproductive health and rights services. Mind you, these are to children, Ethiopian children including family planning to children and nutritional services, that's food, so they can't miss that, within the health system, schools and communities to reach in school and out of school adolescent girls. 
So the Canadian government by 2017 got to a point where they were spending this amount of millions targeting Ethiopian children, minors, adolescents, with a nutritional program, with a program that, that was food, essentially food, and they were going to wherever they could because they needed to get the girls in or out of school. But what was most interesting in this is that they put sexual and reproductive health and rights in it. So as they're giving them food, they're also sterilizing them or what, what have you. So that's your 2017 um, where they are. Now, but someone might just say, but isn't this for the good of Africa? Isn't this for the good of Africa? I've had people ask me that question a lot of times. Yes, we have all these problems. You know, people are poor. Shouldn't they get this amount of condoms or these, you know, shouldn't, they, shouldn't our adolescent girls be getting their implants and, and all whatnot from, from, the, from the donors? And I just want to tell you the story of what happened in Uganda with HIV um, by uh, 1989. Uganda was one of the hardest hit countries in, in Africa, even though a lot of the countries were hard, very much hard hit. But in Uganda, it was particularly bad because a good third of the adult population uh, had uh, contracted HIV AIDS. So by 2001, that uh, the figure had, had dropped all the way to 5%. This is up to today, 2019, this is the most striking and dramatic drop in HIV ever recorded in history. Anywhere, okay? So, but what exactly happened? This was what we found happened. Sorry, this poster is quite tattered, and I'll tell you why it's now tattered. This was the program that was launched by the uh, Ugandan government, particularly the First Lady's office, because if you look here, it says the office of the First Lady. It was an abstinence program, and it was all over the country during the time this happened to them. So she's keeping herself for marriage. Uh, what about you? This was about this was the What About You project, and they were going into schools and they were teaching people about abstinence, teaching people about uh, monogamy and fidelity. The government was right on it, the church joined in and the church did a lot of amazing work because I have spoken with Ugandan bishops and a lot of them were involved in this project, but the project was, was, was both a faith-based project and just a regular government, uh, government driven and government supported project. And a lot of things happened in the nation. There was behavioral change, and I know for, because I know when I speak at universities, people will just say, well, you can't just anecdotally say that. But surveys were done, so it's not just anecdotal, because by 1989, a survey that was done showed that about 80%, 60% of the 15 to 24 year old single males were saying that they were engaging in premarital sex. This was what the survey showed. And it wasn't just the males, the, uh, all, the, all the demographics also, the different groups of people had similar answers. There was such a high rate of extramarital and premarital marriage and, and all, uh, sex and all that. So, so this was what was going on by, two, by 1995. Uh, the number had dropped to 23%. It's quite a drastic drop. It's significant enough for it to make any difference in this particular survey. The same group of people were, had had a complete behavioral change. And the, the trend continued. And this was why by 2001, the nation was reaping good uh, statistics. They were seeing a huge drop in the disease. They were seeing a completely different lifestyle. Uh, and yes, yeah, this was how the Ugandans themselves with their own uh, decision, by their own, by their own selves, they decided that they were going to have a complete change in their country. But what happened? Just like what happened in Poverty Cure, another person came to set up a What About You project, because if you look at these massive billboards, I took this picture uh, a few years ago when I went to Kampala. These billboards had replaced these tattered ones because the, the tattered ones the reason it started is because nobody was making any more new ones. Because the donor came in, they didn't like the approach, they told the Ugandans that uh, nobody can, can uh, it wasn't a sustainable and evidence-based type project that they were doing. And the donors came in with so much condoms, so much money for condoms, they were pushing the government, they were telling the government that they're putting people at risk by pushing this one approach that is so strict, is so restrictive. Even though the nation had done it, and even though it had been proven, it had been shown even by you know, a lot of the scholars who were coming through from other countries were saying, this is amazing, we haven't seen this in any other country. 
They set up these billboards, and this was not run by the first, mind you, this was run by the first lady's office, so this was pretty much local. That was run by the USAID. So if you see the little sign here, it says from the American people, so the USAID, United States Agency for uh, International Development, was paying for it. They stole, which I find the most wicked thing in this, is that they stole this particular phrase, what about you? This was the what about you campaign. So this guy says, um, I am in charge of my condoms. What about you? Right at the bottom. So they replaced this in such a way that people don't notice that there has been a complete replacement. So this was, this is exactly how the Ugandans were hurt. Because that 5% figure is no longer the case. It has gone up again and it's going up maybe about 10% now. So it, they, they're no longer at that point of abstinence. The whole abstinence program was completely defunded. The government has been distracted. Of course, you know, where African leaders, when, when there's enough pressure and enough money, there was so much money being thrown. You saw the $12 billion, this is what it is for. They, when it comes to things like condoms, they have an unlimited amount of money that will go into it. So this is what happened in this African country, and it's only symbolic because it keeps happening. Wherever the Africans decide we want to do our own approach, somebody comes and replaces it. But this is how important that, and how significant what happened was, that, that they were replaced in such a manner that they were attacking people who were insistent on, on the you know on the abstinence and uh, abstinence program and the, the fidelity program and the change of behavior the behavioral change uh, approach they came they were demonizing them they were attacking them they were telling them that what they were doing was not scientific it wasn't it wasn't a, a evidence based to the point that this um, let my people go AIDS profiteers actually uh, just an article and the reason that I keep telling people about this article is because it was published at the time in 2008 by Washington Post, but now it's gone into some kind of archive. So it's so, so hard to find online, but you can still find it and read the entire article because I think it's worth a read. It was written by this man, Reverend Sam Rutakaira. Rutakaira was the co-chair of Uganda's National AIDS Prevention Committee. So this was one of the, he was one of the men who were right there at the front lines. He was one of those who were uh, working really hard to spread the, the, their own locally uh, sourced, if I can put it that way, their own local decision and their own national decision to use this approach, the behavioral approach in Uganda. He was very much one of those and he saw the wickedness of the international community because when they came through, they ran down everybody and they just wanted nothing other than to see the abstinence, all those abstinence offices shut down and they did eventually replace them, uh, you know, at this at this point in time. I, I was only in Uganda last month. There is not like that kind of big drive through, uh, everybody talking about abstinence, like, yeah. So this guy wrote this article, which was published at the time, but now I don't know. Washington Post has now put it in an archives archive, but you should find it because it's still there and you can read exactly what happened in, in Uganda and see how uh, this thing called aid how ugly it can be, how much a beast it is. And even then, when you add it to uh, the fact that there is an ideology that is that one is pushing, there, there's one particular thing that they want, or a lifestyle that the donor wants promoted in a developing country, uh, that's, a, that's even a more dangerous uh, combination. And the, the AIDS project was, was one of those that showed it. So I just want to show you one of the another you know another thing that happened it's all on the same line of the condom promotion the just a, what i will call an aggressive condom promotion because when i say that sometimes people say you're so harsh no i'm not being so harsh i'm saying exactly what happened uh, what happens constantly in africa because it's not only in the past it's still happening till today but this happened in 2012 which was after the whole uganda uh debacle this happened in kenya so the uh, again USAID in conjunction with the UK uh, DFID, so Department for International Development, which is our own, the, U, the British uh, Agency for Aid, they went to Kenya and they, they ran this condom ad one minute. So it's only 60 seconds. I'll play it now for you. But I'd like you to know one thing that this ad was so offensive 
while the ad was expensive to make you're going to see now the quality was very high it's very hd you know um and they ran it on on government television and within a few days the kenyans were agitating people were writing petitions people wanted to riot people were were asking the the the, uh, the censorship board to remove it from the air the reason being that the ad went directly against the way of life of the people um, and mind you, the Kenyans were not even the ones who were, you know, so in intent on the abstinence and fidelity programs. But this was this was one attempt by the by a Western uh, power or by a Western donor to further their own way of life, or their own agenda in the lives of the people. So this is a married woman. She's uh, she she's married. Obviously, her name is Mama Mama Michelle, I think. So that's Michelle's mother. And it's not in English, but I have subtitled it, so I don't know if those in the back can see it. If you can't, I do apologize, but it's, it's, it's almost self-explanatory. You can see what's going on. She's, uh, she's married, and then it's implied that she's having an affair. Um, and there was the boyfriend who was like a young man in the side there. So the Kenyans were saying, no, our women are not like that. Our wives are not like that. This is an insult to our way of life. But what makes it even all that much worse is that it was paid for by dollars and pounds in an African country. So what audacity. and I knew what was going on because there was so much um, there was so much complaints about it but I had to get someone to, to translate it but this is an insult and this is what the donors do everywhere they go in the developing world especially in African countries nobody can come into Canada and run an ad that is against your way of life or your values as a nation from outside your country this is absolutely unacceptable but it did happen in kenya and they did it on like they pushed it pushed to, to see how the people would react and of course there was such such a, an immediate response and it was removed but this would have cost them a lot of money to make you see the quality of it you see how the sound everything is so expensive and so you know and, and that's how the taxpayers money go because uh, there's so much money given. So when it's taken out of circulation, then what happens? The British people have already paid for it. The United States taxpayers have already paid for it. But this is how ready they are to, to burn money just to make sure that their ideology is out there wrapped up in an African, and you can see it's all African women. So it's just to get us used to the idea that you know one can be married and be having an affair. As long as you're using the condom, you're okay. No, it's not okay. Because uh, the Africans will complain, especially when it's come from the outside. So um, yeah, that's just an ex a little example. So let me just talk about abortion a little bit because I think I've talked about condoms uh, quite a bit. So <laughs> let's go to something else. Not that it's any more pleasant. So this is <laughs> So this is what the map looks like, the landscape of legal abortion. I do apologize because I got this from the website of the people who keep the, who are the best trackers of what legal and non-legal, you know, where abortion is legal and where abortion is not legal. And they are, of course, the pro-abortion people. They are the ones who have uh, 
enough people working for them that they're constantly plotting graphs and they're constantly keeping track and they're checking more than anybody else to know who has abortion and who doesn't. So the first apology I always make when I use this uh, map is that wherever you see that is green is where there's legal abortion, wherever isn't green, like all the red means that they don't have legal abortion. If I made this map, it would be <laughs> See, because where, where abortion is, you know, it should, should be red. It should be red for what it signifies. So, but anyways, from the Center for Reproductive Rights in DC, and you can see that much of Africa, of course, is uh, hardly any green on there, except you can see down south, there are four countries actually that have what you will call abortion on demand. There are various levels of prohibitions in different countries. Um, and a few exceptions in some countries, but these are the countries that have legal abortion. Uh, okay, so we have uh, 54, well now 55 African countries and four have abortion on demand as you would have it in this country. Most of the other African countries then reject abortion. That, that, that means that about 80% of African countries have refused to legalize abortion essentially. So, but even with that in place, even with the reality that 80% that of the African countries are saying no to abortion, okay? We are still having donors come through and talking about their safe abortion initiatives. So this was the first one that I managed to track. It says in IPPF, IPPF stands for International Planned Parenthood Federation, which is not a surprise to anyone if I said that they're uh, the ones who have put something like this together. But what you must know is that it wasn't theirs. They were only the people who were delivering this program, the Safe Abortion, the Safe Abortion Action Fund, SAF. But it was being paid for by about six Western countries. So the donor nations was the United Kingdom, uh, I think the Netherlands, and, and a few other countries. So. It, what they normally do is that the donors are there and then the African countries are there and they always use very much like in economic situations, they always use like a Western uh, uh, third party. So they would pay IPPF a lot of money and IPPF will come to Africa and deliver these things. And whenever they make the, the manual or whatever, or they write about, about their so-called safe abortion, they always put a black African woman there. So just so you think, oh, the Africans are doing this. No, we didn't do it. It was all paid for by dollars and pounds and euros. Huh? So, but they still find a nice picture and put out there. Safe Abortion Action Fund. And then this is the most recent. The She Decides campaign started uh, two, uh, 2017. It started because President Trump decided to defund International Planned Parenthood Federation, Mary Stokes International, everybody who provides or promotes abortion in the developing world. So the United States took away their money and because the US is one of the biggest donors of uh, reproductive health and rights, things are now a little bit confusing in, in that whole arena. Everyone is running Helter Skelter, they are crying all the time. They're saying, oh, they've taken away our money, they've taken away our money and enter, uh, you know, enter into the scene is uh, Justin Trudeau, mm -hmm. who then has given 650 million Canadian dollars to make up for what has been taken away from the abortion industry for Africa. So this is the new one. And the Canadians were also part, I think the Canadians supported this project, the She Decides campaign was all started off in Brussels. Then the, on the first day they launched it, it was like an emergency meeting. They raised immediately 181 euros right there. I've never seen anybody so willing to give money. I mean, these people raise money in cocktail parties uh, and they raise millions once it's for reproductive health for African nations. Sometimes I tell my fellow brothers and sisters in Africa that I don't know if you know how, how eager these people are to see you uh, aborting your own children and sterilizing yourselves into, into extinction because I've never seen anyone so willing uh, to give money as, as a Western donor who, who you tell about reproductive health or whatever in Africa. So you can see again, African kids, what she decides is purely an abortion, uh, a safe abortion initiative uh, but that is donor funded. So the donors will versus the recipients way. Now you saw this the safe abortion action point. So anytime they talk about African abortion on the international scene, even at the United Nations, I was only there 16 days ago, two weeks, two weeks and a bit ago. 
they always put safe abortion, you know, they don't just talk about abortion, they talk about safe abortion. So you would see a lot of materials that have safe abortion written on it. But just so you see where the African people stand, this is a picture that was taken in Sierra Leone by a lady that I know because I went out to Sierra Leone a few years ago when somebody was pushing an abortion bill out there. And you can see that she has written on this, that these women were doing their own protests a local protest. I didn't tell them to protest. I came there to help them. And these women were more pro-life than myself, so I just sat to the side and we took pictures. It's great. <laughs> I mean, these women were there. You know, she said, we don't need any safe abortion because they that bill that was being pushed in Sierra Leone was being pushed as a safe abortion bill. So she, is, she writes, we don't need any safe abortion as nothing is safe in killing. So we say no to abortion. This, is, this was a... a a homemade sign. This was a sign that this woman decided to make in her own home. And to let people know, I always tell people, I did not make this sign because nothing is spelled wrong. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so this is something she does on her own. And everyone, they're all like against abortion, so strongly against abortion. And I've seen many, many women, especially rural women, especially poor women, especially just women who all they want is to protect their own children and they know what abortion is they absolutely know what abortion is they just think it's wrong and they don't want anybody coming from anywhere to tell them it can be right they just want to you know they just want to protect uh, their children and their grandchildren and their own bloodlines so that's uh, you know this is what the, you can see the nice slick one that is made in in london and you know, with an African woman there, this woman probably would feel the same way as that when she wouldn't know her pictures being used to promote a safe abortion action plan. Well, that's just by the way, the Africans never respond. Yes, because if you take the picture of a woman in a village and you put it on an abortion manual, she doesn't know, okay? If it's here, she'll sue you. And one day I just said, <laughs> yeah, one day I just said, I'm going to go to Africa when I get money and get a legal fund and we get women to sue people and really get out of poverty. <laughs> <laughs> so, but then these are the ones who are constantly ignored when the donors come. This is a picture we took in Sierra Leone when they were, uh, women came out in full force, just women coming out to protest the abortion bill that was being uh, pushed at their parliament. And they were saying no to abortion. I mean, this I took in Accra, Ghana. And you can see this woman dancing. This was, we were having a match for life anyway. And she said, save the unborn. She's carrying it. This was the one I took in Douala, Cameroon. Don't know to abortion. It's all the time. This was Abuja, Nigeria, where my own country. And abortion hunts women. These are women who, if you give a, ch if you give a chance to the African women or African men, they always say no to abortion. Or they always say abortion is wrong. Or they know abortion is wrong. They don't want it. But the donors come with their safe abortion uh, campaigns and the sleek abortion campaigns and the she decides campaign. Uh, anyway, so here is something more. Um, you know, I, I'm a scientist, so I always love to move with numbers and figures because yes, we have all the anecdotal and all the pictures we've taken in Douala and Accra and you know Freetown, all these places. But I love to move with data as well because data does not lie. The facts do not lie. So this was a Pew Research survey that was done in 2014, 40,000 respondents, 40 nations. So it was both developed countries and developing countries, and they were on moral issues, and abortion was, of course, one of them. This is exactly what it looked like. There were so many other countries, but I just selected these ones of interest. And I put Canada there, of course, because of you all here. So the, asking people, is it morally acceptable or unacceptable to you abortion? Some people, of course, if you find it's not up to 100%, it's because there are people in between or people who can't decide or people who think it's not a moral issue at all. So keep your eyes on, the, on this middle line of uh, whether abortion is unacceptable, because that's how you know that those who say abortion is unacceptable are the people you would describe as pro-life. Hmm? So... Now, in Canada, there are about 26% pro-life people. I think that's kind of accurate. In the UK, it's sort of the same. America is, is a higher percentage. Uh, but yeah, I'd say about a quarter of the Canadian public would be, would be pro-life. In South Africa, where abortion has been legal for 20, 22 years now, it's 61% against abortion, strongly against abortion under any circumstance. In my country, Nigeria, is 80%. Yes. <laughs> in Kenya, 82%, in Uganda, 88%, in Ghana, 92%.
So for any donor to come into a country like this and try to push, and the only people accepting abortion are like in the single digits, by the way. It's like 2% think it's okay, 2%, 3%. So the only way a donor can push through any kind of abortion is by some kind of trickery. I've seen them do all kinds of things. They can only get it through the politicians. They can only get it through parliament. We've seen it happen in a country like Mozambique, where abortion was an abortion bill was passed, was then uh, it was uh, passed and then signed into law by the president. And I was phoning people that I knew in Mozambique and Maputo. Uh, nobody knew about the abortion bill. Nobody asked for it. No, it was all done in Parliament. The Sierra Leone one happened the same. Uh, some people got a handful of politicians, talked to them, talked them into it. It was done. Within a few days, they had a passed an abortion bill on December 8th, no less. If, if you're a Catholic, you would know what that is and how the implications of it. So we started making phone calls. I spoke to the president of the Catholic Bishops Conference and he said, don't worry, we're already talking to all the other religious leaders. They have an inter-religious uh, committee, which is made up of, of the Catholics, but also the Muslims, because it's a predominantly Muslim country and, and the evangelicals. So they all went as a religious leaders delegation to the president's office and they told the president, you, you dare not sign this bill into law because then we will uh, we will go and tell the people that you did this and then you will not be, uh, you will be people will vote you out of office. And uh, we watched something miraculous happen that the president said, you know, I can't sign this bill. This was in 2015 and ever wow. since they have been the pro-abortion people from America and Canada <laughs> and the UK have been pushing for Syria to legalize abortion. The, the Sierra Leoneans have just said, no, we, we're not going to have it. So there's the bill that, that passed the House unanimously almost and just was never signed into law. And the people were happier for it. Nobody protested except the people from the West. Uh, people wrote petitions against the president. The day I saw that petition letter, it was signed by everybody who was living out in New York and Washington, yeah. D.C., and I said, that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> so that's because of these kinds of statistics. But, you know, and anytime anybody ever takes the time to check, you find the Africans are predominantly pro-life. Um, uh, the donor is master. The donor is always master because, of course, like you saw in Poverty Cure, yes, we have all these things like paternalism where they're deciding for us what is what should be good for us. Even though they come to a place like Uganda and they see the Ugandans have decided this is what we want, or they come to a place and they see how pro-life people are, they're still going to be pushing their, their safe abortion, this and that and the other. Uh, we see cultural imperialism, we see what we call ideological neocolonialism, um, that have in the last couple of years now I've just written a lot about and, and talked a lot about it. So it's the power that they have against us and the power they have over us, which you know is uh, is is something to be afraid of. So I I there's this uh, literary giant uh, Chinuachim in my country who uh, has a fantastic quote that I always like to hang on to right towards the end of my talk. That, until the lions have their own historians, the story of the hunt will always glorify the hunter. So, <laughs> you know, anyone who knows me would know that I, I don't, the gates, I don't like the gates very much. I don't like the gates very much. I started off my, my pro-life work uh, writing an open letter to Melinda Gates about the project she was doing. And it's when I talk about the, you know, whenever I, I, this, I call this quote to mind, I always remember people like that, you know, all these people who go out to Africa, at least those who go for the economic side of things, they go out there, you know, like the poverty cure. It's a little bit different because they're going out and sometimes, <coughs> yeah, well, all the time they hurt, most times they hurt people. But many times you talk to someone like Bondo, probably he wants, you know, he just thinks he's doing some good and, you know, they're, 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 they're feeling so sorry for the Africans. The people who are pushing the reproductive uh, uh, health and rights, those who are pushing population control, are coming with even something m much more wicked, something much more, much darker. So yes, this is indeed the charity that hurts, and it's the charity that really means to hurt, because they're coming to change us, they're coming to change our ideas and ideals. Uh, it, it is something higher than, than those who are just coming and destroying our economies and, and making us dependent and giving us aid like, you know, like something I would compare to someone, I work in a hospital, so it's just like getting somebody who is walking about and putting them on life support. 
even though they can walk around. Uh, <laughs> you have them on the, you have them on the ICU when they don't need to be in the ICU. Uh, so it's but the 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 quote that the Africans need to start speaking for themselves. They have to start taking the story seriously. They have to start taking records of exactly what is going on, because if we do not, at this point in time, like what has happened in Uganda is almost being forgotten. It only happened back in 2006, 2007, 2008. By the time they were washing out completely every trace of what the government had put together, every effort the government had made, and every effort that the religious leaders and the churches had made, um, it's always being washed out. But I believe in keeping history, and I believe that we should remember that and not forget it. Because those who did it to us, one day they're going to get the Nobel Prize. Honestly, if the gates will get the Nobel Prize, I am going to protest in Oslo. I will go there by myself, because what they've done has really hurt African people. Uh, if the current prime minister, I know I'm in Canada, I shouldn't be saying this, but honestly, I am a little careless in the way I talk. If the present, <laughs> if the present Canadian uh, Prime Minister will get any kind of award for what he's doing in development, I will go and protest in that place. That's not the <laughs> Us. You've seen all of these things I've shown you, the graphs and all of that. Yes, at one point in time, Canada, yes, was still giving some money to population program. Let's just say they don't know what they're doing. If you're giving 3%, maybe you think you're doing some good and with some discussion, you can still change and, and change the way you think. But at this point in time, Canada, the Canadian government is giving money for a nutrition program in Ethiopia that is more about family planning for the children, for Ethiopian children, uh, than, than anything else, than the food. So it's very, very unfortunate, but I believe in telling the story, and I believe in, in us all taking records, because in the next 10 years, maybe one would not remember what has happened you know, from 2014. It would be all that far gone. And that's why I decided to make uh, the, my, my documentary strings attached, which I'm going to play for you six minutes, if we have six minutes. It's a, it's a longer documentary, so you can see it online, but I have six minutes here um, uh, that shows exactly what it feels like when, um, you know, when, when Africans sit, sit down and tell their story. As you saw, in Poverty Cure, it's so amazing because you heard the people talking themselves. Mike, Mike uh, went and spoke to these people in Ghana and they talked about how their businesses are being hurt and how, and that's something similar to what I did. I went out to different African countries and I spoke to some people who have been honestly hurt by what the donors have done and the work of the donors who are the enthusiastic uh, population program donors in Africa. So this is one side of aid that I would uh, implore you to open your heart to and even resist, especially when your tax dollars is going directly to it. And I've made some calculations that if you had like just a regular job, you're not like a multimillionaire or anything, uh, before you retire, in the course of a 30 or 35 year career, you'll be giving up to 10,000 uh, Canadian dollars to this kind of project in the course of your one career. So if you think it's not a lot of money, it is. Yeah, so you give 10,000 over 30, 30 years or so to these, to these kinds of projects. You should, you should resist it because it's your money paying for all the billboards and all, the, all of that. So I do thank you for your attention and I hope that you enjoyed the little bit of strings attached that I've brought today. And I, I have the book, it's not a lot, but I apologize, I came from Notre Dame to here and they, they took a lot of those books. You know how people in Notre Dame, you know, they just bought, bought, bought the book. So, <laughs> so I, only brought, I only brought 20 copies. Uh, apologies, it's on Amazon as well. But um, let, let the conversation continue and I, I, I applaud you for this program that you do and that, that you're taking the effort to understand exactly what charity is and, and how charity indeed can help or hurt people. Thank you.
Western donors have shown more enthusiasm to fund sexual and reproductive health and rights, population programs, family planning, and even abortions in Africa. According to the 2014 report of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, an organization that tracks foreign aid, Africa received from their Western donors more funding for population programs than they received for education, healthcare, water, and sanitation. I'm pleased to announce that the government of Canada will be investing $650 million in sexual and reproductive health programs for women over a period of three years. I'm just wondering why somebody would be so concerned with um, the affairs of another nation, especially when it comes to issues of abortion. We have seen women cry and weep and wail and groan. We have seen women depressed, too depressed that they cannot even administer counsel at that moment. We have seen women lose their jobs because they are too depressed to go to work. We have seen women lose their families, lose their husbands because they cannot cope with the, uh, with the trauma of abortion, the depression they are going through, the anger that they are going through, surely is that development. I got pregnant and the first thought was to abort. So I went to a clinic. That's what I just asked for. I just went and said uh, I want to do an abortion. And there was no counseling or anything. So. They just did it. When I was uh, 18, I was just I just completed my high school, and uh, I got myself involved in a relationship that I got pregnant, and I was a very naive girl. I didn't know about abortion much at that time. Uh, when I spoke to somebody who was very uh, significant to me, a family friend who I looked up to. Uh, they told me that they would take, help me to take care of it. Shortly, I found myself on an operation table. And when about 20 minutes my baby was born, I walked in there and I walked up without my baby. I think they should really know that they are hurting others. My family was affected too. If I'm sad for a day, they are scared. Oh no, the depression is back. They went through a lot trying to figure out what you're going to be, how to support. Because no one tells you what after the abortion. You never get to hear of those who rejected the abortion. It's just quick out, you're done. How much are you paying? <sighs> that is not fair. Anna Aguaro encountered Marie Stokes in her village where the organization was given free contraceptives. She was talking to accepting a long-acting contraceptive implant known as no plant. If no plant sounds familiar to you, it is because back in 1999, it made headlines like this, and this, and this. Yet, long after countless women in the West rejected this device, it was being given to African women in rural places where most do not even have access to hospitals and doctors who can help them in the event of side effects. The difference between these African women and the women in the West is that no one bothered to compensate them for the device that destroyed their lives with symptoms like these. <laughs> With the amount of suffering she was going through, she went back to Marie Stokes to have the no plan removed, and she was told she had to pay to have it removed. So a device that was given for free was going to cost her money to remove. When asked how much, she said, this is about what it will cost her to feed her family for a week. I have traveled now to 10 different African countries. I have 
gone to about 20 different African cities. I've spoken to so many people. I've spoken to so many women. Every time I go out to Africa and I speak to the many, many African women, none of them are telling me how much they want contraception. None of them are telling me how much they want abortion. Every time I'm speaking with, especially young African girls, even some of them, you know, want to become doctors, they want to go to med school, they want to go to law school, they want to go to engineering school. These are the dreams that I find African girls speaking about, the billion dollar project. Why could it not have been for the education of the African girl? Why could it not have been to give African girls the opportunity to get into schools, to get fantastic education, to have a new world open to them and to have them be able to stand shoulder to shoulder with girls and women all over the world? So the question that many should indeed be asking is whether the funding being given by Western nations, Western organizations and even Western private foundations to African nations whether the funding is supposed to help alleviate the different forms of suffering that we see in Africa, or whether the funding is being given by these donors for particular ideological reasons. Are they trying to move the Africans away from their cultural views and values? Are they giving us gifts and strings attached? This is a story about how the people of Africa are being ideologically colonized in the 21st century.